Sure thing. Uh, thank you for for inviting me for uh, for also the introduction. Um, and basically, as as uh, Jim was saying, I'm very freshly, let's say, still considered very freshly a graduate of a PhD program, uh, working in my first postdoc. And I thought I'm gonna tell you about the work that I've been doing in a PhD mostly, and then also towards the end a little bit about my current work. Um, and it all is in this general context, general topic of biological visualization. And my specific um, specific subtopic, specific focus was on um, coming up with techniques on visualization and interaction that help to bring biological data more close to, let's say, general public or students or in, in general, people who do not, do not have the domain knowledge from biology, but still would like to learn something about the biology and how, how life works on all these different scales and mostly the scales that we cannot really perceive with our naked eye. Um, so I promise that I'm going to introduce myself a little bit shortly. Uh, I'm originally from Czech Republic, so excuse the accent. Um, I, I did my undergraduate at the university in the second largest city of Czech Republic and my undergraduate uh, degree was in computer graphics. So you can maybe also see some top, some, some um, general note, uh, notes or themes in the research because I'm really coming from the computational uh, computation, uh, computer science direction to, to computational biology, not from the biological side. Um, and I did my PhD in data visualization at uh, Technical University in Vienna, so uh, Theo Wien uh, in Vienna in Austria. And I was supervised by Ivan Viola and co-supervised by Eduard Greller uh, at the VIS group. And, you know, Vienna, it's actually very um, somewhat of an epi uh, epicenter for, for visual computing research. There's actually a few, few uh, research groups, some, some institutions on the border of industry and academia so it was really great uh, great time uh, and now i'm doing a postdoc at Bayer Kosnikova's lab uh, back at Masaryk University because somehow it came up in this perfect storm of a topic and a position available and some PhD students that I thought uh, would be very nice kind of a, a way how to progress in, in my career. Uh, so I mentioned my general uh, topic of research is visualization in this biological domain. Uh, and sort of for us, the molecular visualization is often mentioned as one of the oldest examples, oldest branches of scientific visualization. Uh, and initially, as you can see here on the left, it was really just a huge deal being able to show on a computer screen even just a single small protein. Um, but as the acquisition and imaging and even computational technology got better, we got progressively larger and larger structures. And so for us as visualization researchers and computer graphics researchers in general, um, it's just a really great motivation that, that pushes us to be able to visualize and somehow enable people to work and interact with models of structures that are maybe on the level of a small virus or maybe even cell uh, at some cases. Uh, and so we had these progressively larger models coming from our um, biological domain collaborators. And one of those is an example of a mesoscale molecular model generated by a CellPack, uh, CellPack software from Art Olson's group at Scripps. Uh, where they kind of model this intermediate scale between molecules and cells. So you know much, much better than I uh, about the divide between molecular and cellular biology because of the resolution and scale of acquisition techniques that, that, that exist or existed traditionally. Uh, and so as we got larger and larger and more complex biological models, modeling 3D structures, uh, we luckily also had development in in computation uh, in, compu uh, in computing technology. So more specifically, we got the GPUs that suddenly supported a much more much bigger loads in 
in computing and in rendering. So this graphics hardware really supported us in being able to visualize these larger structures that contain maybe millions uh, of atoms in real time. So these are visualizations that you can actually explore interactively. You can rotate the camera and look around with interactive frame rates. So these are just like some, some examples of some landmark works from our field, from data visualization field. Uh, and it kind of culminated, at least for, for me, with this work by my, my PhD supervisor, Ivan Viola here on the right bottom, um, and his first PhD student who were making this software called CellView. And this is kind of a stress test um, that they, they generated. It's a one data set of an HIV embedded, embedded in plasma uh, that was actually uh, computed by Art Olson's group uh, on the biological side. And here, this is uh, kind of an artificial version of this data set copied several times to showcase the capabilities of rendering systems, uh, of a rate rendering system that they developed. And you can see that this is a huge data set. So I think this contains uh, in, a, in a scale of billions of atoms. And of course, you are not storing those atoms uh, on the GPU. At the same time, uh, uh, there's, a, there's some sort of a level of detail scheme um, in order to, to render th this large data set. And for me, from like the uh, visualization perspective, when I came in, I, I realized that this the problem of rendering such a data set has already been solved. So what now we have as a challenge is how can we interact and navigate and make sense of these structures? So one, one aspect that you might notice is that at this point, at this level, you are not interested in uh, individual atoms. You cannot even see them because they are smaller than one pixel on the screen. And you are interested in this larger, uh, higher level uh, organizational units let's say here is the HIV, the, the, the virus particle. And so again, coming back from, to, the, to the motivation for a visualization researcher, uh, we can look and we can see that this data has some, some unique characteristics that you cannot really see in other examples. So for one, we had this really multi-scale and hierarchical organization, uh, how biological objects basically built uh, into one another uh, and this leads to a really hierarchical organization uh, on multiple scales. And this is always for us a, an issue with understanding how these scales fit together. Uh, and uh, maybe other important aspect is that this data is incredibly dense. So you can really only see the outer layer of this huge block of, of data. Uh, and then the final uh, final aspect is that such data is what we call truly truly 3D, truly three-dimensional. And for, for us, what that means is that uh, there are objects that are distributed somewhat equally and equally dense in all three dimensions. Um, and so what became for me the, the topic of my PhD was sort of how do we enable people to interact with a model like this? And of course, when you are thinking about how people are interacting with something, you always have to think about who these people are. And so this brings me to another part of the motivation. Um, so what we were at this time fascinated about, uh, fascinated by was uh, this topic of science outreach, science communication. And so uh, you might have noticed that the style of the cell view rendering from the slide previously, it looks a little bit like something on the left. Uh, and this is not by accident. So this, this rendering style was chosen, uh, was chosen deliberately to resemble the illustration style of David Goodsell, who's basically like a superstar in, in scientific art. And he's making these hand painted illustrations of mesoscale molecular models. Uh, and this really, for, for some people, this is really kind of putting all the pieces together. So there, somebody might be studying uh, a, a virus for their whole, whole career and they know every little detail about it, but then putting things together in this visual sense, it really helps to bri bridge these 
um, gaps between the knowledge because suddenly you see this one picture and you you can start asking questions you can start reasoning about whether this image is even correct if this is how you imagine uh, that the structure might look like and it just the scientific scientific illustration and just like the general topic of science communication it really for us um, combines or provides grounds for 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 communication not only between uh, a scientist and general public but also between scientists so that's just one example of science communication that's really hugely inspiring for us um, and the second example is drew berry who on the other hand is making molecular animations uh, he's using an industry standard tool for animation uh, i think it's um, autodesk maya in his case uh, and this kind of brings another another aspect another dimension with the time and with the animations and showing the processes not only static structure um, and so for us scientific visualization presents itself just as a another uh, natural very natural medium for science communication that we wanted to explore and maybe even exploit um, in some sense uh, but the interaction with very extensive visual environments has been really not that much explored in the context of scientific visualization so that's what became the topic of my doctoral research uh, and of course like we are from uh, as a computer scientist we are very focused on publishing um regularly on on more of like conferences and so for me my phd was kind of composed of this of these three papers um, and we are targeting this venue of IEEE transactions on visualization and computer graphics, which for us is like the, the, the top publication that we can get. Uh, and I'm going to just, in the rest of this part, really shortly from a high level of Berg's perspective, tell you about how the, these individual papers, these individual, individual techniques contribute to the whole goal of, uh, of using data visualization for science communication and what i like to start with is an example from something completely different um, so if i show you this picture of a map and ask you what city this is i don't think a lot of you would be able to answer this question and some of you might recognize that this is vienna and if it would be so if you are intimate with the area and you for example, know the shape of the rivers uh, or some other geographical features. But the key element that is missing here is some sort of annotation, some labels that are so ubiquitous in, in online maps like Google Maps here. And the thing, the point that I'm trying to make is that with data visualization, we often have the same, very same problem. We show the raw data and if it's in 3D, it can be very dense, it can be very, uh, maybe beautiful to look at, but kind of a kind of useless without any form of annotation for some proper exploration and understanding. So we have this problem, and what we wanted to tackle on it in the first place was how we can uh, include some sort of annotation, contextual labels for, for scenes like this. And we have um, coming back to the kind of aspects of the data set this provides this proves it difficult to just implement the techniques that are maybe used in in a map environment and mostly the the difference is between that this data and this this model this virtual environment is really three-dimensional it's not just a flat plane that is even so mapped on a on a surface of a sphere but it's really 3d and the user can look at in any direction and the other the other complication is, of course, the multi-scale aspect where you really cannot see, you cannot really tell uh, easily on what level the, the objects should be labeled. And so we had an idea. Uh, maybe we assume that not all of the objects should be labeled on the individual instance level, but some might be merged, merged um, with some other objects and then given a common group name. Um, and maybe so that the, the, that's what should happen to the objects in the background and in the foreground we of course show all the, the 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 names for all the individual objects and in this case this would be the individual proteins let's say and so this idea is very similar to something that is very common in computer graphics for us 
uh, which is called level of detail, where you have a mesh and you sort of degrade it, uh, reduce the number of vertices for objects that you don't even see that, that, that clearly that are in the background. And we just applied the same concept for, for labels, where we, um, the further from camera an object is, the higher on a level of, uh, let's say, abstraction or a hierarchy it's, it's annotated. And so the output uh, is a method called levels, uh, uh, labels on levels. And it's, there's a lot of technical details uh, about things that have to be decided in each frame for this uh, technique to work. Uh, but generally, this is how it, how it looks like. This is how it works. So the user can look around and depending on the view, they get um, labels for the objects that are shown. And yeah, so this was sort of the, the first foray into making the, the, the object somewhat, making the visualization somewhat graspable by by somebody who's who hasn't studied let's say hiv in their in their work in their research uh, and it kind of it kind of also helps people to really ask better questions so before if we show this this scene this visualization to uh, an, a complete outsider they might ask okay so what is this red kind of squiggly thing in the middle uh, and this is kind of unproductive way to, to conduct a discussion. Uh, and so if we have the label suddenly, not in this case, but there might be a label showing that this is an RNA. So then they can ask a better question, for example, like what does the RNA in the virus do? So for us, these, these textual labels were really an uh, important part and important starting point. And so we, we had this paper was actually very well received uh, as, as my first paper during my PhD. And one thing that you might have noticed is that we were still looking at just half of the whole data set. Uh, because if we show the whole data set, this is what it kind of looks like. You just really only see the outer layer. So we still have the problem of navigating the, the three dimensional model. And the topic of navigation in virtual environments is really uh, heavily researched, but mostly in the context of what we call uh, human scale environments. Uh, so this is usually some uh, kind of using the metaphors of a person walking on a surface of, a, of an earth. And even if there is a multi-scale aspect, it still considers these um, environment where object where details are maybe densely populated but only on a surface of uh, of earth it's not like in our case where the 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 whole 3d environment is heavily populated and really dense and so i got really interested in this idea of navigating and transcending scales of biology. And that this is one of the tests that I was doing during my PhD and encountering, I was encountering the issues with navigation in multi-scale environments. So here, for example, the problem is that you, if you use the natural interaction with, um, with zooming, uh, with scrolling with your mouse to zoom in on, on, on features, then you have to use a lot of zooming to jump between the empty space that is between the scales. So on the right, the green slash yellow thing is an HIV virion, and the thing on the left is a, a size of a cell. And so there's just a lot of issues in navigating a three-dimensional three environment um, using the conventional techniques. And I like to really draw a lot of inspiration from, from other media. So for example, from computer games. And this is one of the games that was really also very inspiring, very um, kind of good to think about how this would this navigation would, would translate to actual data. So this is a, call, uh, a game called Everything, where you can basically play as everything in the game world, and you can this way kind of take control of smaller and smaller and smaller objects. And you can go from a, the human scale down to, um, I think the DNA is like the lowest level. Uh, and so I really like this idea of just having a, a, a world and then you just dive in as, 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 as small as you can, as you want. Uh, and I was thinking 
if there is any way how we can employ somewhat similar interaction. Um, and the other inspiration is actually, you probably know this movie, Jurassic Park, and this was not only influential for me because it was uh, a landmark use of, of CGI, uh, computer generated imagery, uh, but also because of this scene uh, where they kind of control the, the park system, the locks specifically using a computer system that navigates files like a hierarchy of files uh, using a 3D interface. So for us, from uh, we know from research that this is actually a really uh, not so not such a good way to to encode and enable people to look through a hierarchical file system. But it was still kind of in, in influential and interesting for me to see um, how you can model hierarchical spaces in a three D spatial context. And hopefully, if I show you the next next work, it's gonna fit in how how this uh, what I mean by that. And so, coming back to the motivation, we have these biological models that are three dimensional, and there's a lot of interesting detail inside. But if we show the whole models, we only see the the outer shell, not the interesting detail and, and features that are inside. And so, one way to to yeah, so that this is the the example the kind of illustrating the problem on the model of an HIV that is embedded in this piece of blood plasma in this cube where the outer layer occludes all the internal objects. And so one way to tackle this maybe is to have a list of all the object types and then you allow people to kind of query, uh, query um, and show only the selected objects. But this kind of disassembles it it, it disconnects the information about how these pieces fit together to build the virus. Uh, and so what we again came up with was a technique for uh, browsing of the 3D model, hierarchical browsing of the three-dimensional model. And it has several components. And we, we use the, the textual labels that we, we uh, came up with in a first project and we basically allow people to more intuitively navigate both the spatial aspects of the model and the hierarchical uh, building, uh, the hierarchical aspect of the model. And so we have this, uh, the, the labels that are suddenly not serving only for the annotation, but they are also functional links. And the inspiration is here, uh, they are called hyperlabels and the name is inspired by hyperlinks, which uh, work in a very similar way. So a hyperlink in web context, it takes you to a different location and it serves as this connecting mechanism between locations uh, and levels of a, of a document, uh, let's say in the context of a uh, web browsing. Uh, and the other parallel is with a file system. So file system on your computer is really a, a large hierarchical, uh, hierarchically organized information space. And you also browse it in this way that you're clicking on icons on text of folders to dive into this folder structure. Uh, so for us, what uh, cl click on, on a hyper label means is that you change the context and you dive into an object uh, that the hyper label annotates. And so in this way, we can traverse the hierarchy from the top level down to the level of individual proteins, let's say in this example. Uh, and we also somehow, uh, if we dive into the hierarchy to the lowest level, we also need to a way how to go back, go back up. So for this, we use the uh, a, a design element that is also very much used in, in web design uh, of this breadcrumbs panel that shows you your current location. So it also has an element of orienting, uh, orientating the user. Um, and so, and also it allows you to go back. But the problem is, so we, we have then also this way of intu intuitively navigating the three-dimensional model. Uh, but then the problem that we still have is that if, if we show people uh, scenes like this, they still have no idea what they are looking at. I mean, they have an idea of what they are looking at, but they have very little idea about what all the individual objects are serving for. And so I have a kind of a first hand experience because at Maso University and also at Seuvin, we had a lot of these open days where 
people, maybe uh, students interested in the in the in the university, or may or even completely general public coming from the scientist nights, and you basically show them your research, uh, show them what you're doing, and for us as computer graphics people it's maybe a little bit simple because we can actually show them uh, images and animations and interactive systems uh, but still in the case for me uh, showing them biological visualization i still need to sit there and explain to them what they are looking at and what are the uh, biological questions let's say related to the visualizations and so there's always this need for a domain person to commentate in in this context of explaining science, science, biology to, to complete uh, non-experts. And so what we thought, what we remembered, or at least what, what we kind of come back to is these molecular animations, like I was showing you from, from Drew Berry in the beginning, in the beginning. And these animations are actually more and more being employed also in educations. So I, uh, I know that biological or medical students are using these animations to learn uh, how these different processes on a molecular level work and uh, these animations are often very expensive uh, or time consuming to produce um, and then once maybe some some facts some some uh, new hypotheses come they are very uh, tough to to change and incorporate this new knowledge. And so we thought maybe there is a way how we can produce movies like this, uh, documentaries like this, uh, in a more automated, scalable way. And so that's the, the last project of my PhD that I've worked uh, on. And it's called, uh, and it's called Molecumentary. So we are making molecular documentaries uh, in a somewhat automated way. Uh, and we call them molecumentaries. And molecumentaries, they address several topics. So first, when we are interfacing data visualization with the non-expert users, uh, they might not even know what they're, what, what's interesting in a model, what they can look at and what's the point of interest that is worth their attention. So that gives us a, a motivation for taking a little bit of control from them so, and instead of allowing them to explore anything in the interactive system, we sort of guide their attention. And there's also this need of, of expert explanation because without it, the visualization is just a, a pretty picture. And so we kind of formulated this idea of scalable documentaries where the conventional ways how to create the documentary um, would be replaced by somewhat and uh, a somewhat automated method. So, for example, for the for the audio for the commentary, we don't use an actor, a voice actor that would commentate, uh, but instead you leverage text to speech uh, software to turn existing texts into a commentary. And this whole framework for generation is sort of based on the distinction between a story and a narrative. And so we build up this story graph structure with interesting facts about the individual objects in a, in a, in a model and then generate narrative that is somewhat of a um, stochastic combination of these story elements, these facts. And there are two versions of the molecumentary framework. Uh, one is what we call self-guided where we really determine the narrative stochastically in real time by traversing the story graph. And this way, this is kind of aimed at the, at the case where you are in a museum or a science center and then the molecumentary would run the whole time and somewhat always show interesting parts of the model uh, in a loop. And no matter how long you stay, it will always be a little bit different each time. And the other uh, case scenario is what we call text to molecumentary, where we take the narrative as an input and then parse the sentences and show relevant visuals for the for the for the story told by the by the narrative. And I think the the sound is not working, but basically, the the text that is on the left side is read by the by the artificial voice and. There are the 
objects that are mentioned in a in a commentary is featured in the in the visuals in the in the video. And so, kind of to, to sum it up, uh, is the that I, I've heard by several people this kind of a holy grail idea of replicating a very influential video called the Powers of Ten. And if you if you know this video, it kind of has two parts. On, on, on the first part, in the first part, it goes from this human scale of this man having a picnic uh, and it zooms out to the edge of the observable universe at that time. But the other part, which is much more interesting for me and, and for, for the people that I was collaborating with, uh, is how they are diving, how the video is diving into the so-called negative scales, looking at the life of the, uh, the microscopic life, let's say. And so during my PhD, I was contributing to this vision of having the pause of 10 video, um, but interactive. And there are a lot of challenges and we are very far away from actually having a system that would be so comprehensive and so complex that you could actually stop at each of these levels and explore around with real data. But some of these, technique, some of these techniques that I worked on hopefully contribute towards, towards this goal from the technological perspective. Uh, and so I still have some time uh, to, to talk about the research that I'm kind of switched, switched to during my postdoc. And you might think about this, the, the stuff that I was working before, it's that it's nice, it might produce nice visuals, but is it really all that all that useful for for biological research and the answer would be that yeah it really uh, isn't used the visualization that i was making before and the te uh, techniques and uh, visualization interaction techniques they are not really aimed at the day-to-day -day work for by computational biologists uh, and so for for my postdoc i kind of wanted to switch a little bit and wanted to make tools for actually that are actually going to be used and useful in the biological research. And for me, like even during my PhD, one of the most interesting structures or, or um, objects in biology is the, the genome. This is for me like the most interesting and, and somewhat complex structure. Uh, and also from the perspective of how many levels uh, how many scales it, it occupies and so this is very interesting to to look at from visual uh, visual and visualization perspective and so we had some collaborations even during my phd with tobias isenbeck where we were looking at how do we visualize all these different levels of organization and then i had a chance to uh, during these past i think two years since i finished my phd to kind of revisit this topic and learn a little bit more about it and so uh, this is really a simplification and I hope this is not gonna hurt uh, uh, the, the computational biologists in the audience because I really did my computer science vocabulary. It's very um, tough for me to, to explain uh, truthfully, uh, but high c is kind of like the method used to exploring the structural structural organization of, of, of genome, of chromatin in a, in a cell nucleus. And the, the HiC method, it produces these HiC maps, which, is, which are like a contact frequency matrices, a, a heat map basically. Um, and maybe this representation for me, when I first saw it, it I thought like this is, it's impossible to see anything in it. Uh, and, but for people who are, very intimately familiar with it, but maybe they are making doing their PhD in this area, they can actually see patterns in it. But still for me, and I think for a lot of people who are looking at it for the first time, it's much more, much more natural to look at the 3D structure that uh, the high C map actually describes. Uh, and there are ways how you can, we can go from the high C observations to a 3D structure prediction. And of course there are intricacies and uh, it's still a prediction, so I think this is really important to, to keep in the data and in the visualization. Um, but still, the, this idea that we can somehow get back this 3D structure of how the chromatin might be assembled, might be 
uh, might, might be tangled inside a cell, it's very in, uh, uh, exciting. So we were working with, uh, uh, with Teresa clients who was doing a PhD uh, in the UK, modeling these, these three dimensional uh, structures. And what we kind of uh, learned is that there's actually a lot of, lot of tools, a lot of visual, visualization tools that are looking at the 3D chromatin models. But the, um, the field is very uh, scattered and a lot of these, these tools don't even work. And there's, there's one um, called Nucleome browser that is kind of the, the most feature complete. But even in this case, uh, the 3D, 3D visualization is very rudimentary. And for us, like my background is really in computer graphics and I'm really interested in, in the 3D visualization as opposed to all the 2D track views that are, that are offered by a lot of the, the genome browsers. And so I was really ex interested in how we can uh, improve the, the 3D aspect. And so one of the, one of the, let's say very basic, basic issues that we've seen in a lot, of, a lot of these tools is in terms of rendering and shading. So the representation and shading, it really matters a lot in how you perceive the three dimensional structures. So for example, here, the, the 3D model, chromatin model is represented just as spheres using this very um, conventional form shading. And you can, you, what you can see is that you really cannot reason a lot about the shape. Uh, and so if we switch the representation to something like a tubular one, uh, we might get a sense more of the, of the connectivity information, but still the, the general shape is really uh, messy inside and there's a lot of occlusion, a lot of, lot of visual clutter. Uh, but if we employ some sort of a better shading estimation, we suddenly see much more and we can get much better sense of the, of the shape. And so we even see this hole inside that is probably occupied by something like the nucleolus or something. Uh, and so we were really interested in putting uh, the, the advanced 3D visualization techniques um, and looking at the 3D chromatin models from this perspective, and this is mostly the work of, of a PhD student that I was working with during, during the, the postdoc now. And we put this into a system that we call Chromoscan and kind of one of the most interesting and, and let's say challenge, challenging challenge from the visualization perspectives is how we link the representation. So we have the 3D representation that tells us some information, but then we still have the, the uh, high C heat map and potentially some, some uh, genomic signals modeled on a, a genome browser-like view. And we are thinking, how do we enable people to work with, uh, with all these three representations somewhat seamlessly? And, and so this is something that we are exploring. And so we have a paper that, that describes this, the, uh, this system hopefully coming out uh, at some point. Um, and so this was really like the base for us to exploring this very challenging uh, genomics field. And there are some, some works that we have uh, in the pipeline. So there are two PhD students that I'm working closely with. Uh, one is looking at a sort of a hybrid representation between the 1D, 2D, and the 3D, uh, because in the 3D, the most important or interesting uh, feature is how the different bins are close uh, in close proximity. Uh, and so we are looking at and how we can keep this information, but still use uh, a somewhat of flattened view. Uh, and the other PhD student is looking at, at dynamics and it is closely related to comparing um, comparing uh, the 3D models. And we have some other collaborations. Um, maybe one thing is that for us, one thing that I wanted to mention is that 3D visualization, what, what in my experience is really challenging to work with for people who do not have let's say computer graphics background because there's just something something so inherently more complex about working with a 3d representation 
um, that there's a certain barrier of entry. And so this is something that I'm looking in a future to maybe uh, hopefully use making some tools, making some progress um, in, in this regard to, to make it easier for biologists to work with the 3D models, be it for chromatin or maybe some spatial single cell data. So this is what I'm looking forward in, in, in some future work. Um, and that's kind of it, the, the a slice through, uh, through the research that I was doing during my PhD and somewhat of a, uh, also doing the postdoc. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Very much, David. It's really a tour de force, and I, I do apologize to those people who were not seeing the screen update. Uh, I believe we will have a video available at some point very soon, so that will at least allow you to see the amazing visuals that, that came through. And particularly on, on my internet is not so good, but they were looking really fantastic, so... I think uh, Juno is also doing very well for presenting high content, real time animations from GPUs really well. So uh, you can be certain everybody will have been impressed, David. So I'll take a look at the Q&A just to see. Uh, so we don't okay. have any right now, um, but I do have a few questions. So yes. I, I, was, I was interested uh, just when you said right at the beginning that that you were, um, you were kind of, I, I don't know if you were, you were happy or not happy that you discovered that basically modern GPUs have solved all of the graphics problems to begin with. And now it's more of a, a design and interaction problem. But um, I mean, GPU technology is still increasing in power. Uh, and of course, it's not just used for graphics. GPUs are used for analysis. So do you, can you see a point when there will be GPU applications which will do both sort of deep, high, high, well, deep and large scale data analysis at the same time of doing visualization? Or is that still something that can't really be dealt with in the same sort of in real time, the real time system? Yeah, OK. I mean, absolutely. So I can maybe relate a little bit with something else that I'm um, I'm thinking about recently. Uh, but just as an anecdote, so I was mentioning Teresa, and we were at some point talking with her about, she's a computational biologist, and, and we were thinking, okay, maybe there are some of these algorithms for the structure prediction that we could, we could accelerate um, using GPUs, uh, GPU programming. And she was saying like, oh no, nobody cares about that. Um, if you, or at least in the context of the, of the, let's say chromatin structure generation, uh, because she says, if it's just a matter you wait for a process to finish in 10 minutes, as opposed to uh, 10 seconds, it really depends on, on whether this is something you do once, once a week, once a month, or maybe once a day. And in, in some cases, it's just something, uh, the process that the, the really heavily uh, computation heavy process that you're running once a month, you don't really care if you are waiting for it for half an hour or even one day. At least that, that's the anecdote that I heard from her. Uh, but I definitely was interested and, and I still feel like there's a lot of potential in doing computation fastly on the what we call client side um, and this is maybe also relevant from the point of privacy so for example a lot of the medical data uh, you cannot really upload them on a server and there are some some limitations in terms of also legislation <laughs> and this is definitely something then um, that will require computational power locally for you and then it really is a matter of if you can finish the task and finish the the processing um locally in some reasonable time so in that case absolutely there is there is um 
potential and and kind of a need for for doing the computational work also and uh, when it comes to combining computation and visualization i think this is also something very interesting because in a lot of cases visualization is kind of a helper it's really serving pe serving people in their work it uh, i think maybe a lot of people in the visualization field feel that the visualization is like the end point but really for me it's just something that you you ideally use in your work and it's a part of the process not the not the result in many cases so definitely uh i can see visualization being useful in the the, the process and like a part of the analytical pipeline let's say thank you so we have a couple of questions from yuri berkman and uh so the first question i'm i'm going to do the biological one first but the final one afterwards i suspect there's going to be a lot, lot lot of answers there so firstly could um he's asking could you label the 3d chromatin structure with locations of genes and regulatory elements yeah 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 so this is something that that i'm actually working on kind of right now um and so it fit it kind of the the general direction that we're looking at now is that genes are just one of the one of the features that you might want to map on the 3d structure and it can be very interesting and we are what we are basically doing so far is that you uh, allow people to add markers I don't know if it's visible on any of these pictures. I think probably not, but you basically mark a location, a certain specific bin. Uh, you mark it that it contains the gene that you're interested in. And this is exactly what the 3D structure is good for, because suddenly you can mark the locations of genes and you can see whether they are in close proximity. And then this gives you an information about some, some sort of interactions if i say it this simply so you can definitely do that the the question for us is just if you if you label all the genes it would probably be a, a, a big mess so kind of some form of filtering is required uh, but this is something that we are definitely looking looking towards um, and so uh, what i was mentioning is that the genes are just one of the interesting features so other would be um, you can kind of see it here on the on the screenshot of the whole tool, um, how we are also coloring the, the, the 3D fiber by some genomic signal. I'm not sure which, which one that is, but then you can maybe identify some collocations of, of a peak in a genomic signal with some interesting structure in 3D. And this is really what we are aiming to, to provide people the means to, to do. Okay. And uh, Yuri's second question is, could you recommend any educational videos or games for school age, school age children? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, of course, the, the Drew Barry's animations, I think, are excellent. And uh, I think mm, there's actually a lot of people that are kind of uh, students that are coming from this uh, from from that are inspired by works from him so i know janet ivasa has a lot of a lot of videos or maybe not a lot of but she's working in this in this in this sense um and when it comes to games i'm actually not sure so there are i know about some applications that are I mean, okay, so the issue with, with games usually is that um, uh, games and educational content is that a lot of the times it just using, it's using models that are created ad hoc. It, they are not based on real data and they kind of take a lot of art, uh, artistic license. And so then the question is whether the person making it is an artist or like a 3D modeler uh, or if there's some form of legitimacy when it comes to the data that the model is coming from. Mm -hmm. So that's usually the issue. So I, I, I've seen a lot, of, a lot of games or interactive systems that are aiming to educate school children. 
uh, but I I don't know if I've seen anything that I could kind of point towards as something I could use uh, right away. And my sister is actually a biology teacher at the elementary school, and we were talking about it. And so they actually acquired, the school acquired a VR headset uh, that had some educational content, but this was actually really the case where there was just a cell that was a, a sphere basically and inside there was a representative for each organelle and you could see that this was really a low poly model of somebody just taking it and and really there was for me it was very for one misleading and then also there's the the educational value was very low so mm -hmm. cannot really sh tell any recommendations as of yet mm -hmm. So I'm I'm going to plug a an educational game that's been produced by Beata Ditomejva, who um, she is uh, she, she has a game called Microscopia, and I'll put the the, the link in the chat. And I'm going to do another plug for uh, the the VR exhibits which we are running at Bisbee this year, where we'll also have a list of serious games, as they're called, which uh, we're going to try out on the Bisbee audience as well. Um, but also looking at VR content. So, I mean, with, with the VR content, do you think that some of the limitation is actually because the technology was not really high resolution enough? Or is it, yeah, is it simply that yeah. they, they don't have any biologists involved? I mean, if one, one thing is definitely that basically the VR, it requires such a uh, frequent updates, like a high frame rate that yeah, the content creators inherently have to make sacrifices when it comes to the fidelity of the content. But then the other other problem for me really is that in order to communicate a lot of these topics and use the data even, you basically have to have a PhD in computational biology. So even myself, I don't, I, I wouldn't have the confidence um, to tell anybody or create content about the biological question. So I think it, the issue is that you have to really be highly proficient in two fields. You have to have expertise in the biology or if it's a medical field in, in the medicine, and then you also have to have the technical proficiency. And so this is, I think, really challenging to find uh, a combination of people. I don't think it can be one person. And when it comes to companies, there's always this um, kind of a compete, um, the competition, it, it, it doesn't sell as much, it doesn't sell so well. Uh, and so I think it's very hard to, to find the sweet spot. Um, okay. And get the expertise. So I'm just going to come back onto the science again, just for, for one last question, if we don't have any more. Um, so one of the I mean, really, really big things in 3D modeling at all scales is uncertainty. And the uncertainties in chromatin, 3D chromatin data are somewhat large, but they're also actually dramatically varying. Uh, are there any approaches or have you begun to look at this at all? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm aware of this problem and I'm subconsciously thinking about it because even the like even the way that we get this data it comes from such a complex pipeline of of um, the high c method and then processing of the results and then the, the modeling and i felt like it would be really appropriate to somehow encode the the uncertainty that comes with it but it's somewhat of a of an open research problem i would say so so in, in molecular visualization there has been some um, some work towards indicating the uncertainty, let's say on a level of a protein. Um, so I've seen some some approaches how to visually encode an uncertainty of what certain uh, segments of the protein uh, carry. Um, but I haven't really applied any of these con uh, concepts on the on the chromatin. But I really feel like this is a needed part. Um, to communicate the, the data because then you can I mean that's the issue with visualization in general because you suddenly give people an um, an an image a very concrete visual there is nothing to hide it's not a description for uh, 
a textual description that you can interpret. It's something that you concretely see. And so people suddenly can make, start making uh, assumptions. And it can be good in some sense because, you know, we make a, 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 an image and then a computation biologist can come in and say, okay, but no, this is not something that you actually know. Um, this is uh, some, somehow, uh, it's completely differently in reality. And I know this because of this experiment. So it can serve as this interface point between for discussions, as I was mentioning in the presentation, uh, but then yeah, it definitely carries the problem of misinterpretation. And uh, this is some, this is very important aspect uh, that, that should be uh, looked at more. <laughs>